Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you again for another episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. I'm so excited to have with us today my guest, Charlotte Terrell. She is a coach. She is, uh, in the past, she's been a clinical therapist. She is currently a transformational life coach, a speaker, and an author. She's evoked changes and positively impacted the lives of hundreds with her authentic, insightful wisdom and her witty approach to life and its circumstances. Charlotte has authored three books. She's founded two companies. She currently owns and operates Images Motivational Consultant Agency, which is designed to support, assist, and improve the lives of individuals, groups, and families in the areas of compassion, communication, confidence, and coping. Her mission is to help people rediscover their power, peace, and happiness. Welcome, Charlotte. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I've been planning all week to come and see you, so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being my guest, and (laughs) um, I think it would be cool to maybe even just kind of start with your story i always i like to ask my guests like how did you come to do this work i mean what prompted you what inspired you to work with people and especially i'm curious about the transition in moving from traditional you know therapy and being a therapist to more of a coaching practice right well um even my mom is a retired vocal music instructor and so she's always had older kids around me And although I was a normal kid, I was, they call me a brat and all of that, but (laughs) I had my moments where they would actually talk to me about things that were going on, you know, whatever a teenager goes through, they would talk to me as a teenager about this is going on and this is going on and that's going on. What do you think? And I would give them a listening ear. And for some reason, I've just always had that innate ability to listen and have compassion on other people. So when I went to undergrad, I got my bachelor's degree in social work because I thought this is probably going to be what I need to do for the rest of my life. And I enjoy helping people. I want to see them be happy. And so whatever tools that I can give them, I can do that. And I was told that the probably the best route would be to do therapy. But in order to start making money as soon as I got my undergrad, it probably would be better to get the bachelor's in social work as opposed to psychology. So I said, well, if I ultimately decide to be a psychologist, I'll get my PhD in that. But fast forward to completing my bachelor's degree, I started off in a day treatment facility when I was doing um, therapy with them. And I had to do, they called them back then master treatment plans. And I had to do quarterly plans. And we used, back then it was the DSM-4, but now it's the five. And we just had to diagnose, well, we had to follow the guidance of the psychiatrist and the psychologist. And we helped them with their their goals. And it could be as simple as bathing every day, um, maintaining your physical boundaries, not getting in people's face too up close. I remember a client like that, you know, taking off your jacket, you know, just simple things like that. But some other were other things, of course, were more therapeutic. So we thought of those interventions as well. And then I wound up getting into therapy full time after that. Well, I continued in therapy and I enjoyed it. And I liked having the talk therapy Um, in the treatment facility. I did group therapy as well as individual And then after that, I did individual therapy solely. And then I did some family and couple therapy. So I thought it was great. But then 20 years in, (laughs) I was like, okay, there's got to be more than just sitting and listening to somebody for an hour that we've talked and we've cultivated a relationship for a year. And a lot of times they're talking about the same things. 
and I was beginning to feel, okay, it's been an hour. He's going over an hour. Okay, she talked about this last week. We're gonna talk about this again. Okay, great. I wonder, and then I started wondering about myself. I wonder what she would do if I had on clown shoes or I had a clown nose on. <laughs> If she came into the session, would she continue to talk to me or would she be asking me, well, what is your problem? So I just said, you know, I don't want to do anybody a disservice. And my heart is not necessarily not in it. It was still in it. But I said, there's got to be another way that I can help people and move into something else. Mm -hmm. So that with that, I decided to go into coaching. I think it was around 2010 when it really started getting popular. But even before that, I was doing some coaching, but I didn't know that that's what it was. And um, I just liked the fact that there were actionable steps and people were able to move from point A to point B and really deal with where they wanted to be and they were happy and the light bulb was going out or was going on and they were deciding that their lives were better because of coaching. And so that's really what I became passionate about. And I met a lady at a conference and she said um, she was doing some computer stuff with some women helping them with computers. She said, but there's something else I can give them, but I don't know what it is. I don't know anything else really but computers. I said, well, I could do self-esteem workshops. Oops, who said that? And then from there, my business just kind of evolved and I became the person that people called to do self-esteem workshops and the women were really involved and they were empowered and I was excited about that. And then, um, I guess my first coaching client was not paid, but I met her at a repast <laughs> of a funeral. And she talked about how miserable she was at her job. I asked her what she did. She said, I do X, Y, and Z. And I said, well, why are you doing it if you're miserable there? And she said, well, it's just kind of a means to an end. I don't have any other alternatives and I got to pay bills. So we kind of talked about some things that she could research and things that she could do. And long story short, the last I heard, she was doing what she loved because of the tools that we were able to share. You know, I was able to share and we were exchanging a dialogue. And so that's kind of my story in a nutshell from beginning to now. <laughs> and I really just enjoy seeing people be happy, empowered, and enlightened. Mm. Nice. Yeah. And so tell us for the for the audience members who may not know the difference really between coaching and therapy, because I certainly I do both uh, still and I definitely get people who don't really know the difference. How do you yeah. explain that to them? With therapy, there are licensures that are involved with the therapist. There are certain education, educational tracks that they have to follow. Um, there are interventions that are put in place and diagnoses that are followed. And once the diagnoses are given, generally there are therapeutic sessions that could last from now to eternity. I know people that they don't say, well, I'm going to see a therapist. They say, I see my therapist. And they've been seeing the same one for maybe five or 10 years. And so it's a long-term relationship. It is more intensive in dealing specifically with diagnoses and um, mental health concerns and just trying to come to a resolution as to how to cope around those mental health concerns that you have. With coaching, there is an element of help, but for me, um, I think that I would prefer to just, if there are intensive issues, that somebody needs to overcome, I'm going to refer them to a therapist and then we'll work hand in hand. So for instance, with coaching, someone wants to transition from teaching to being a nurse. And we talk about that. Well, how do you do that? Well, what certifications do you need? What education do you need? How many hours do you have in teaching that could be transferred into a degree with nursing? And so just kind of talking about what it'll take to get from where you are to where you're going and then put those steps in with it. And just really a coach to me is more of an accountability partner, just like in sports, you know, we tell, you tell your team, this is what I'm expecting. This is what you're going to do to win. And I'm going to be your cheerleader, but these are the things that I noticed last time. So this time in order to be more successful, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. So I think that a coach 
and real in um, as a life coach is pretty much the same as a coach in sports. If you can kind of think along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there to support you, but also hold you accountable and call right. you out on your BS when yes. you're there. Yes. Um, and and to really cheer you on and also to like help you improve your skills and performance, maybe even give you, teach you some new skills, especially yes. like organizational right. type skills, like life skills, even like so many mm -hmm. people, you know, don't know how to communicate. We're going to talk more about, you know, your four C's, but like people yes, don't yes. know how to communicate. They don't know how to cope. Um, so not all of us are healthy, you know, grow up in these healthy homes where we're taught those things, right? So sometimes a coach has to even just sort of teach some more of the sort of basic life skills, right? Right. 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 Like what we were talking about before, not getting up in people's faces, not, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, not interrupting people. I don't know, whatever, like sort of basic, right. you know, rules of engagement. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And some of the things that we take for granted that we believe, oh, you know, that's just common sense. Just like if somebody gets on the elevator and they're facing the wall, everybody usually faces the doors, but if they're facing the wall, you're looking at them like, what is your problem? You know, didn't anybody teach you? It's just a social norm for everybody to face the doors and say, oh, what is their problem? So sometimes we think things are common, but it's not common for everybody. So we have to have grace. And then we also have to maybe teach people things. And that's what coaching is for. Right. And whereas therapy really is focused on uh, a diagnosed mental health con condition, mm -hmm. and it's really about um, a remission of symptoms. You know, yes. if you have, for example, if you're looking to get your insurance to pay for therapy, the therapist has to be able to demonstrate that there is a medical necessity for right. you with this diagnosed condition, there's a medical necessity for you to be in therapy, to focus on remission of those symptoms. Right. You're so depressed, you can't get out of bed, you can't function, you can't engage in social activities, you can't take care of your ADLs, your activities of daily living, you're unable to work, these types of things. And I think right. people sometimes don't understand that. Like I've had people want to come to what they thought was therapy to like learn more about themselves or to be happier and unfortunately our medical model system isn't designed to pay for you through your health care insurance to have that kind of right exactly exactly and i'm thinking that probably insurance will evolve since coaching is taken off in rocket forms, you know, the insurance companies are going to want to chime in on getting some of that money. So I think ultimately they may start paying for coaching, but right, like you said, they're not paying for it now. And if you want to explore your happiness and what makes you more powerful and what makes you more peaceful, then it's probably not going to be therapy. You're going to probably want to see a coach. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of clients do you find that uh, you are working with in your practice? Like I know some coaches have like kind of a specialty or a little, you know, niche market or something mm -hmm. like what is your focus? Uh, my focus is on professional women and a few good men. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we really delve into life balance and what works and what's not working. So say, for instance, I have a a CEO who is having a bang up job at work. You know, the team is cohesive. They're re she's retaining her team. They're being productive. They're performing highly, but then she's going home and she's in the midst of a divorce or the kids are not performing well in school. So we're just talking about just a lot of things we can't control. They're outside of our control, but what can we do to control ourselves and to help those that we love in these situations in order to be content and to help ourselves and to them and them to be happy. So I'm working with that, the life balance, um, realizing that perfect Patty died a long time ago. <laughs> You're not perfect. Your children are not perfect. Your dog is not perfect. And so be okay with that. And really my message is to be okay with not being okay, but find the tools to be okay and use those, you know, sit in it. You know, I, I talk about the fact that I lost my dad to COVID in October. And if I feel sad and I cry and I miss him, I feel sad. I'm in it, in, the, in that moment. And I cry and I miss him. And I may even say, I miss you, dad. I say a prayer and then I go on. 
but I don't feel bad about missing my dad. <laughs> you know, I'm a human being. And so being present and being okay with whatever it is, take off the mask, hence the name for my company, Images Motivational Consulting Agency, take off the mask, really look in the mirror and see who you are, all of who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So women, and um, like I said, a few good men. <laughs> mm-hmm. So so really self-acceptance, right? Yes. And like you talked about- And um, self-love. Self- and self-love, yeah. And you know, it's funny, people sometimes don't really get the distinction between some of those terms, but I've always thought of self-esteem in order to have self-esteem, to have self-love, to feel good about yourself, you first have to have Mm self-acceptance. You have to have, you know, you have to be willing to look at the shadow side of things. You have to be willing to look at the stuff in yourself that you don't really want to, like you said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you're going to be able to embrace all of it, all of you, um, and, and have that love, not be in a space of judgment about yourself. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 you know, having the same mercy that you have on everybody else, because we tend to really be, oh yeah, she's just, she's just eccentric or she's just this, or she's this, that. And we, we just love her like that. Well, why can't you love yourself that way? Why can't you just embrace yourself the same way you embrace other people? Mm-hmm. So really, you know, taking that and thinking about it and using that to formulate a love for self. And like you said, an acceptance as well. Yeah. So tell us more about tools. You mentioned that you teach your clients tools for all of this. What kinds of tools do you teach them? I do several exercises and it just depends on the need because I tailor make everything for everyone. But um, I know that in the past I've used the Beck anxiety inventory and the depression inventory. Uh, I have not used it recently, but that's one of the tools just to even determine where you are. You know, you say that you're depressed, but I don't think you're depressed. I think you're just kind of maybe in a situation that you're not happy with. And so really doing an inventory and figuring that out. I have have people to do a thankful inventory. That's a tool that I use where you're doing a, what are you thankful about? What has been the, what are the good things in your life? No matter how small or how huge they are, what are they? And it could be as beautiful, as simple as it's just a beautiful day and I woke up and I can breathe. Some people can't, you know? Um, so taking an inventory of that. I do, I've heard that there is a, that this is called a dumping exercise, but I've kind of tweaked it a little bit and called it a blotting exercise where I have you to write down all of your offenses, everything, all the abuses, all the pains of your past, write them all down. And then as you're able to forgive and release it for good, blot it out with a Sharpie, a black Sharpie. And once your whole page is black, burn it and never revisit those things again. So I've heard, like I said, I've heard people call something like that a dumping exercise, but I've got the, the blotting exercise that I do and just different mindful exercises that I do to help people to get through the gunk in order to get to the planning for the things that they want to do career-wise and otherwise. Right. Well, and because that's exactly it. How can you uh, accomplish any of your goals if you are holding um, resentments, judgments towards yourself, you feel the guilt, shame for whatever happened in the past? I mean, people are dragging their past around like a bag of rocks. Right. Weighing them down. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, it's important to be able to identify your positive attributes Sometimes I've had people as another tool to write those down. And I find that if I have people to do 10 positive attributes and three deficiencies or three weaknesses, that they are struggling with the 10, but they can easily, oh yeah, I'm too this, I'm too that, too loud, I'm too fat, you know, and all of these things. And it's so much easier for them to find the negative things about themselves instead of the positive. But once we do identify the positive, let's harp on those things and let's meditate on those things. And let's talk about how we can make those things better. And also remember that a weakness is not a life sentence. 
just because you don't know something today or you're weak in that area today, does that mean that it will always be so? You didn't right. always know how to walk. Right. You didn't always know how to talk. So, I mean, you know, now I talk too much, but <laughs> I didn't know how to talk before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you didn't know how to drive a car and you know exactly. what, probably, I know the first time I got behind the wheel of a car, I drove the car off the road. It's like, <laughs> Like, you know, that's the other thing is that perfectionism type mindset where yes. you can't make a mistake. You right. got to get it just right. And then people right. end up, it's that perfectionism procrastination trap mm -hmm. where they're trying so hard to get it right. They end up taking no action at all because exactly. they get paralyzed with that fear of making a mistake. So exactly. You're really working with people around shifting those mindsets yes. that are getting in their own way. Yes. Yes. And, you know, one of the things that I don't hear people talk about much is the other side of the coin when we scrutinize others really closely, because when you are in judgment and you're just like, oh, well, she said that word wrong, or, you know, you're scrutinizing, scrutinizing every little thing about other people, then when the camera's on you, you do the same thing. And it's not helpful for other people and it's not helpful for you. So try to find the good in every person, including yourself. And if there is a constructive criticism that you can use for yourself or for others, then use it constructively, but not to tear people down or bring yourself to a place of, oh, I'm never gonna get here, or she's never gonna get there. My daughter's never gonna perform this because she's never gotten it, you know? What mm -hmm. always was doesn't always have to be. So get that mindset. Yeah. Well, and you're talking about kind of, you know, the classic, what we therapists call projection, right? Yeah. You have yeah. these judgments yeah. of yours, like what you're judging in someone else is mm -hmm. something you have a judgment toward yourself for Absolutely. and probably don't want to quite look at that. So right. yeah, that's a really useful tool is when you notice yourself judging someone else, ask maybe when have I been and done that? And right. do I hold a judgment toward myself that I'm putting on other people? Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the funny, like the sort of like the, the opposite of that, that sometimes shows up, like when I run, I run groups at a drug and alcohol rehab center. And sometimes I have the ladies do this exercise where they write down people they admire and they write down the three qualities they most admire. And then they look for like, which ones repeat. And then I have them write those three on an index card. Well, you spot it, you got it. What if these qualities that you admire in other people are qualities you actually possess within yourself? Mm -hmm. Because again, people are always looking for what's wrong with me, but they're never really looking at what's right with me. And that exactly. exercise can really blow their minds. Like, what do you mean? Like I could possibly have those qualities I admire in someone else. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. And that's so easy to do is just look over that. Oh yeah, you know, I did that before you know, no big deal. Yes, it is. <laughs> if it's a big deal for her, it's a big deal for you too. <laughs> yeah. We minimize, uh, yes. we minimize those are cognitive distortions and, yes. and really in coaching, you're still working with those cognitive distortions. Yes, ma'am. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I was just about to say that. Um, I know you're probably familiar with Dr. David Burns. He coined those 10 back in the eighties but they're still, still applicable today. And I just kind of talk about those and help people to look at those and say, well, where do you find yourself in these? And I, you know, I said, Hey, this is me. The shoulds. I do that a lot. You know, well, she should do this. He's my husband. So he should know that, you know, those types of things we do it all the time. And we really have to be cognizant of those distortions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, and the good news is that we have a variety of tools, whether it is in a, in a more classic psychotherapy setting or in a coaching setting, we have tools and ways to change those filters, mm -hmm. those lenses through which we're seeing first ourselves and then of course the world as well. Yes. So that, that's great. Um, tell us more, Charlotte, about these four C's that you work with. Yes, ma'am. The four C's that I have an area of expertise in are communication, coping, confidence, and then my final one that I've recently added is compassion because I believe that compassion is so important right now. It's, it's love, but it goes a little bit further than just, I love you. This is really the action behind the love, the compassion and the empathy and the really feeling what someone else is going through and 
and understanding it through your heart and letting your heart lead and guide you instead of just your mind. And so I've added that because I think that even before the pandemic, it was just, it's important for us to have compassion on ourselves and on each other. And so I've added that because people really need to know what that means and how do I utilize that as a tool towards my empowerment and my happiness. Mm -hmm. So important. And then what about the others, the communication, coping, confidence, what, how do, how do you work with those things? Communication, I, I, I seem to work with that a lot because people think that they communicate well. You know, if you're having a dialogue with someone, yeah, I can communicate. I just, I, I talked to him yesterday, but did he understand what you were saying? Did he actually take the message that you were trying to relay? Or did he just listen and take it and go on another way. Well, I, you know, I don't know what he thought about it, but I said it, you know? <laughs> so people say things to each other, but they don't understand if the message is being taken wrong or if it is not timely, they're not using what we call the, nom the minimal cues where, you know, you see whether the, per cause if the person is, looking at you and they're looking at their watch and they're looking at their phone, then generally they were not listening to you. So they may or may not have gotten the whole message. So paying attention to those things and acknowledging what the other person has said. Did you actually hear what they were saying? Do you actually know them enough to know why they said what they said. You know, we don't take time to get to know each other anymore. So we don't know that the reason why he said this that way is because he's used to being abandoned or he's used to people rejecting him. So he doesn't say what he really feels. So really being cognizant of who these people are that we're dealing with, knowing who's in our circle, what makes them tick? and listening to them with our eyes. We got two eyes and two ears for a reason and one mouth. So that means that we're supposed to be listening and watching more than we're speaking. And so I, I really like to reiterate that quite a bit when I'm talking to people about communication and um, even with couples, the love language. Um, my husband loves to fish. I'm a city girl, I don't care about fish. <laughs> but because he loves it and he's passionate about it, I love it because of him. So I'll go with him, you know, and, you know, hang out with him. And there are things about it that I like because of the fact that I go with him, but that's his love language. That's what he enjoys. That's what fills his love barrel, me spending time with him doing things that he likes. And so that's a, an example of listening, not just with your ears, but with your heart and with your eyes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a big fan of that uh, love languages, the book, mm -hmm. the five love languages. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. like, and they've applied it not just toward romantic type relationships, but mm -hmm. also family relationships, work relationships. There's like little sub sub books, you know, of uh, and and courses and all kinds of things. We'll Absolutely. put the, we'll put a link in the show notes for that because I actually really like that material and I find it very user friendly. Mm -hmm. um, even just suggesting to clients to get the book and read it. It's short. It makes so much sense. So much miscommunication is happening with uh, a couple of people because they're speaking different love languages. Yes. You know? They don't understand like, why don't you understand like, that when I'm doing this, it's a sign that I care. And the person is right. like totally not getting it. It literally is if you're speaking a different language to them. It so. really is. It really yeah. is. And just, you know, the example of, um, I think it was, it's a prog progressive commercial where um, NSYNC comes in and I don't know if it's Jamie or Flo or somebody says, read the room. So <laughs> reading the room, you know, if, if someone is, having a good day and you're not, don't bring them down. And at the same time, if someone is having a bad day and you're not, don't try to you know, bring them down and just kind of make adjustments according to what you're seeing and match the 
communication. And if it's something that you need to maybe step away from and regroup and come back, then do that. But, you know, whether it's your boss or your dad or whoever it is, try to match the communication. And I'm not saying to change yourself, but just kind of change how you're interacting in certain situations with people. It's very pragmatic, isn't it? It's very, it's very much like practical tools. It's fine tuning. It's about improving your skill set at something. I mean, it's very different than you know the sort of more traditional psychotherapy mindset, which is uh, much more about. Um, gosh, I don't know. It's it's. It, I mean, I guess you're teaching skills as well, but it just has a like a totally different feel to it, right? right. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's a lot freer, and you know. If someone wants to pray and they're a believer, I'm a believer, we can pray because there's just a freedom with coaching that there isn't as much with therapy, you know? So, yeah. Especially when you're having to answer to a third party payer mm -hmm. who has very specific criteria around how you're supposed to be delivering, um, you know, the therapy and what you're supposed to be focusing on. And we should have measurable objective mm -hmm. goals. And right all that kind of stuff. But you also talk about the importance of actionable goals, right? That's a term right. you use. What does yes. that mean exactly? That means something that can be measured, something that can be, that you can do. Like, um, for instance, if you are aspiring to be a speaker and you want to get on the TEDx stage, have you tried to apply? <laughs> These are things that you can do. You can actually go to the website and TEDx right now, they're taking a lot of people that they didn't look at before all over the world because they're expanding what's acceptable to come on the TEDx stage. So those are practical things that you can do. Pick up the phone and you can call people, you can email. So that's what I mean by actionable steps, things that you can do to change your mindset or change your situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Anything else you want to share with us about the four C's or is there any other little nugget of wisdom or anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, there were actually two things that I was thinking about. And one of the things that I was thinking about was um, I have a poem that I wrote called Laugh Out Loud, LOL, and just talking about are we really laughing out loud when we send that in a text or in an email and how laughter is a medicine. So just try to add that to your daily routine. I believe that I read somewhere that one minute of anger shuts down your immune system for six hours. So if one little bit of anger does that, just imagine what a whole lot of laughter can do for you. So add laughter to your routine. Think about funny things, think about funny people, and just try to incorporate that into your daily functioning. Also, and finally, I wanted to talk about being thankful every day for everything because everything that we experience is either to teach us or to bless us or to change us for the better. So I'm not saying that everything is good, but I'm just saying that being thankful opens us up to more good coming to us. So make sure that you're thankful. I was um, praying earlier today, but not from the perspective of asking for anything, but just thanking and getting elated in my spirit, feeling like not only am I thanking you for things that I do have, but I'm thanking you in advance for things that I don't even have yet. And I feel like I have them. And that's really called faith in the, the grand scheme of things. So having faith and believing that you not only will get these things, but believing you already have them, and then you'll begin to see them manifested, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really about, you know, being the energy that you want to attract, mm -hmm. right? It's the same as the law of attraction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And I'm with you on the laughter stuff. Um, you know, you always have a choice, right, of what mm -hmm. energy want to expose yourself to and like television being a good example um at night before i go to bed i'm not watching like heavy duty crime no, dramas no. hospital bloody right no wives with knives before you go to sleep 
<laughs> I watch The Simpsons or Seinfeld yes. or yes. Creek or like one of these whatever's on in that like later hour that's funny. Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes me laugh. Yes. That gives me right. a good in those like uh, late night talk shows, you know, mm -hmm. like I get a good g giggle from Jimmy Fallon or something like yes. whatever it yeah. is that that puts me in a space. I mean, especially if I'm going to go to bed and go into my subconscious sort of world, I don't oh. want to be killing people and uh, <laughs> like getting freaked out and running from bad guys like like people just also are not always very conscious of what they're choosing to expose. Yes, themselves to. yes you know and you definitely have to be careful of what you feed your spirit because like you said you your spirit is always open even when we're unconscious stuff is going in our minds going in our ears going into our spirits and we have to be careful what we're feeding our spirits mm -hmm. yeah i'm in total agreement with that yeah well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for coming on the show today. Thank if people you. want to find out more about you, how can they find you? I always check all of my emails and answers them personally. And that's Charlotte E. Terrell. Oh, well, I'm sorry. My, my, my website is charlotteterrell.com. My email address is charlotte at charlotteterrell.com. So that's C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-E at C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-E, E, don't forget that E, T-E-R-R-E-L-L.com. And I'm always available on that. And I'm looking forward to meeting and connecting with you and call for a free 30 minute consultation. Wonderful. And we'll put that in the show notes for everyone who's interested. And um, any final thoughts you wanna leave us with? Any inspiration or anything? enjoy your life right now live right now and just be happy with whatever your whatever circumstances you're in right now and know that things can and will change for the mm. better mm. thank you so much thank you all for tuning in today to another episode of kaleidoscope of possibilities alternative perspectives on mental health if you like this podcast please do click like share, make a comment so that we can really get these tools and approaches and wonderful guests, get all this out in the world so that people know that there are so many other ways to address what we call mental health issues. There's a variety of techniques and approaches and people who are out there working outside the box of the traditional and truly what else is possible with mental health. Bye bye now. Bye everybody. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.